Welcome back to Generals and Napoleon, episode 26, Marshal Ney, Duke of Elkinghen, Prince of the Moskova, and Bravest of the Brave. Of all of Napoleon's trusty warlords, Marshal Ney was probably the only one that would have succeeded in any age. He had the mysticism of an ancient warrior, seeking only glory on the battlefield. If he had lived in the time of the Roman legions, or in more modern times of the world wars, Marshal Ney still would have fit into these armies and would have led his troopers fearlessly and gallantly into battle. His story arc is amongst the most tragic of all the marshals. As he aptly stated before his firing squad of French soldiers, quote, I have fought 100 battles for France and not one against her, end quote. So how did the bravest of the brave end up being shot by his own government? We will get to that, along with a possible twist at the end of the narrative. Michel Ney was born in the Lorraine region along the French-German border on January 10, 1769. He was the second son of Pierre Ney, a poor barrel maker, and his wife Marguerite. Due to the proximity of his hometown to Germany, he grew up speaking French and German and attended school to become a notary. But life as a civil servant did not appeal to this restless young man. He was tall, lean, and possessed an iron constitution. In 1787, he enlisted as a private in a Hussars Cavalry Regiment. He had a natural gift for leadership and became an expert swordsman, and thus rose rapidly through the non-officer ranks to become a sergeant. As he rose through the ranks, he learned the nuances of his profession and perfected his reading and writing skills. His career might have plateaued at this point, but the French Revolution occurred and Ney's career prospects widened as commoners were able to secure officer commissions. He served in the pivotal 1792 Battle of Valmy under future Marshal Kellerman. The next month, Ney was made a lieutenant in the French Revolutionary Army due to his courage under fire. He was once asked if he ever felt afraid or fearful in a battle, to which he responded, quote, No, I never had time, end quote. In the 1793 Battle of Nirvinden, the French were defeated by a coalition force of Austrian and Dutch soldiers. During the retreat, Ney commanded a small force of 20 cavalry troopers. In a forebearer of things to come, Ney's rearguard surprised and mauled a pursuing force of 300 enemy horsemen. Ney was promoted again to captain shortly afterwards. Curiously, Ney was one of the few who avoided promotion. Although nice to be recognized for bravery, he was one of the rare officers who deflected all credit to the bravery of the men who served under him. He now commanded 500 horsemen and fought at the October 1794 Battle of Aldenhoven under future Marshal Jordan. The battle was a victory over the Austrians, and Ney was promoted again to colonel. He was later wounded in a siege battle and sent back home to recuperate. He was promoted to brigadier general in August 1796 and commanded cavalry on the German front. During a battle against the Austrians in 1797, General Ney led a cavalry charge against enemy lancers trying to seize a French battery of cannons. The lancers were beaten, but Ney's cavalry were counterattacked by heavy cavalry. During the scrum, Ney was thrown from his horse and captured. A month later, he was exchanged for an Austrian general and a prisoner swap. Ney was back at the front in 1799, 
capturing the city of Mannheim, and was soon promoted to general of division on the recommendation of future Marshal Bernadotte. A year later, Ney was serving under the second best general in the French army, Napoleon's main rival for power, Moreau. In the crucial battle at Hohenlinden, 60,000 Austrians slammed into Moreau's 53,000 French troops in a stiff battle. It was a foggy and snowy battlefield, which made maneuvering very difficult. Ney was in his element, leading charges in every direction while capturing 1,000 troops and 10 cannons. His efforts, along with future Marshal Grouchy, helped cement the win for the French, who inflicted 13,000 casualties on the Austrians and captured 76 cannons. This victory, coupled with Napoleon's win at Marengo, helped end the Second Coalition against France. In 1802, Ney married his wife, Agli Louise, in a pairing recommended by Napoleon's wife, Josephine. Madame Ney was the daughter of one of Marie Antoinette's ladies-in-waiting and was a friend of Napoleon's stepdaughter, Hortense. She was described as tall, slender, and extremely devoted to her husband. The pair produced four sons during their marriage. Also around this time, Ney brought the famed military theorist Jomeny onto his staff. Major Jomeny had written a book on military strategy, and Ney was sufficiently impressed to not only hire the Swiss mercenary, but to also finance the book's publication. Jomeny's book was soon translated into many languages and became widely popular in Europe. Also in 1802, Ney was dispatched by Napoleon to complete the conquest of Switzerland. This was a largely diplomatic mission, and Ney performed it with surprising tact and efficiency. In 1804, Ney was named one of the original 18 Marshals of the Empire. In the 1805 Ulm campaign, Ney commanded his famous 6th Corps, which he would lead into battle for the next six years. The old sergeant, who was now a marshal, trained his men well, focusing on fast marching and straight shooting. He also stressed the following, quote, Our soldiers ought to be instructed about the cause of each war. It is only when aggression is legitimate that one can expect valor. An unjust war is utterly repugnant to the French character. End quote. As the Grand Army was surrounding the Austrian army under General Mack, Ney and his men were placed under the operational command of Marshal Murat. Ney thought very little of Murat's skills as a general and assumed his marshal's baton was only awarded due to his being the emperor's brother-in-law. Ney's suspicions of Murat would soon be vindicated after the cavalry leader placed one of Ney's divisions under General Dupont in an isolated position to prevent an Austrian breakout from the encirclement. Ney warned Murat that this division of 5,000 troops would not be enough to stop the 25,000 Austrian soldiers should they attempt an escape. Murat brushed off Ney's warning, saying, quote, I know nothing of plans except those made in the face of the enemy, end quote. Sure enough, the Austrians probed and attacked DuPont's area looking for a breakout. Napoleon soon intervened and sided with Marshal Ney's recommendation. Afterward, Ney grabbed Murat's arm and said, quote, Come, Prince, come along with me and make your plans in the face of the enemy, end quote. It was only due to DuPont's aggressive actions and the Austrians' poor leadership from General Mack that the French were able to win the battle. Ney and his men later secured the Ulm victory with a smartly fought battle at Elkingen. The following year, Prussia unilaterally declared war on France, and again, Marshal Ney was at the forefront of the fighting. At the Battle of Vienna, 
Marshal Ney became impatient waiting for Napoleon's orders and charged headlong into the fight with only the advance guard of his corps. He charged so far forward that he was in danger of being cut off and destroyed. The situation was soon noticed by Napoleon, who sent Marshal Lannes and his corps to rescue Ney and his men. Napoleon was furious, commenting to his aides, quote, Ney knows less about soldiering than the last joined drummer boy, end quote. After Napoleon calmed down, he quietly reprimanded Ney with more carefully chosen words. In late 1806, Ney was more successful in his siege of the Prussian city of Magdeburg. The following year, Ney and his corps showed up at the very end of the horrific Battle of Eylau, which produced 15,000 casualties on both the French and Russian sides. After seeing the huge field of corpses, Ney remarked, quote, what a massacre and without result, end quote. Both sides claimed victory. From there, Napoleon and his marshals pursued the Russians to the town of Friedland in June 1807. This was to be another one of Napoleon's signature victories. After Marshal Lon held a larger Russian force in check, Napoleon Ney and the main part of the army arrived in force. Ney was responsible for pushing the left side of the Russian line back into the town. He did so with gusto, launching wave after wave of infantry attacks. Quote, that man is a lion, end quote, stated and impressed Napoleon while watching Ney's attack from afar. A furious charge by a Russian cavalry brigade opened up a gap in Ney's lines, and his advance came to a standstill. Ney noticed the Imperial Guard cavalry stationed nearby and demanded a counter charge. The Imperial Guard commander said that he could not issue a charge order without direct consent from the Emperor. Napoleon was on the other side of the battlefield, so Ney used a clever tact. He sent his personal escort of Hussar cavalrymen in to attack the Russians. The cavalry of the Guard could not bear to sit idly by and watch their fellow horsemen get cut down, so they finally charged. The Russians were finally pushed back and Ney helped clinch the victory by leading from the front line. After the Treaty of Tilsit brought peace between Russia and France, Ney received his Duke title along with some well-earned downtime. But he was soon recalled in 1808 because Napoleon needed his fire-eating skills in Spain. Unfortunately, Ney's skills did not suit the guerrilla warfare happening in the peninsula. The marshal was used to line formations and linear fighting. The carnage in Spain utilized hit and run tactics and assaults on small units. It didn't help that he was often matched against the British who used reverse slope tactics to hide their true number of soldiers. It was also said that Ney's heart wasn't into the work, believing there was no glory to be found in Spain. As we mentioned earlier, Ney believed that Frenchmen performed their best when aggression is justified and there is valor to be had. Ney's trouble in the Peninsula War increased when Marshal Soult had his lunch handed to him by the future Duke of Wellington and the British in the disastrous 1809 Battle of Oporto. Soult had been totally surprised and almost annihilated by Wellington. Fleeing Portugal without his baggage and losing 58 cannons along the way, Soult finally found safety in Ney's outpost in northwest Spain. Although Ney welcomed Soult and his troops into his territory, he jeered his brother Marshal and made fun of his corps' weak performance. King Joseph made matters worse by telling Ney that he was to be subordinate to Marshal Soult. Want to make a podcast? Spotify has got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere, and even earn money. All one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. 
Spotify for podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters, I've really enjoyed the ease of use and the distribution ability of this platform. This led to open arguments between Sult and Ney. Their subordinates followed suit, leading to infighting between French troops, along with duels between officers. Finally, Soult departed with some of Ney's supplies and cannons without telling anyone. Ney went into one of his customary rages and was soon after defeated by a Spanish army in June 1809. Ney retreated angrily out of northwest Spain, and took it out on the local countryside, senselessly burning several villages to vent his spleen. This was certainly a stain on his career, along with the fact that he did not prevent looting in his occupied territories of Spain. In 1810, Ney was again placed under the command of a brother marshal. This time it was Massena, who was directed by Napoleon to reconquer Portugal. The prideful Ney again chafed at being controlled and was openly contentious with Massena, disputing every strategy decision. Ney was also disgusted that Massena was not leading from the front like he did in the old days. Instead, Marshal Massena was operating the invasion by remote control from the chateau he shared with his mistress. After Massena's invasion was turned back, by the defensive lines of Torres Vedras and defeat at the Battle of Fuentes de Enoro, Ney was made rear guard commander. This was to be Ney's calling card as a military commander. So, what's so hard about being a rear guard commander? Everything. Think about it. If your army is retreating, it usually means they lost a battle and the morale is low. Due to the frantic nature of retreats, it's hard to set up effective fields of fire to disperse a pursuing enemy. It is also difficult to find men to stand shoulder to shoulder to repel an enemy while every other unit is running away. Marshal Ney was the best at all of the above. In some cases, he would literally stand alone with a musket firing shots at a pursuing enemy and knocking horsemen out of their saddles. Ney and his men beat back several attempts by the Duke of Wellington to catch Marshal Massena's retreating army. A British officer named Napier remarked, quote, Day after day, Ney, the indomitable Ney, offered battle with the rear guard, and a stream of fire ran along the wasted valleys of Portugal, from the Taugus to the Mondego, from the Mondego to the Coa, end quote. Wellington, too, was both impressed and baffled by Ney's abilities to offer a surprise rearguard attack and then vanish just as quickly. However, when Massena suggested a counterattack back into Portugal, Ney had finally had enough of his commanding officer's strategies and flat out refused to send his men back into a country with no supplies. With this final act of insubordination, Ney was relieved of his duties as commander of the Sixth Corps. Ney returned to France in semi-disgrace, but was soon needed again by his emperor for the 1812 assault into Russia. He was given command of Third Corps for the invasion, composed of 40,000 troops. It was a composite force of French, Croatian, Portuguese, and Dutch soldiers. Although it paled in comparison to the size of Marshal Davout's first corps of 70,000 troops, it was the corps that would cover itself with the most glory during the famous invasion. 
Ney and his troops performed well at the initial battles of Smolensk and Volotino. Although he lost one of Marshal Davout's best generals in Gudan during the latter battle. In the epic battle of Borodino at the gates of Moscow, he assaulted the Russian center. As the battle raged, he repeatedly requested the elite Imperial Guard be released from the reserve to finish off the Russian army. But this request was repeatedly denied by the Emperor, who was a mile away from the battlefield. An irate Marshal Ney complained loudly of his emperor, quote, What is he doing in the rear of the army? If he will not conduct the war himself, let him go back to Paris and let us command for him. End quote. After a few weeks in Moscow and receiving no peace treaty from the Russian Tsar, Napoleon finally initiated the retreat to France. Davout's corps was in the best condition due to the Iron Marshal's strict discipline and care of his troops, so they were assigned to the rear guard position. Two weeks into the retreat, the Russians routed Davout's corps at Viasma. Napoleon then had Ney and his corps take over the rear guard. It was here that Ney forever etched his name into the history books. His leadership and tactical brilliance helped the remnant of Napoleon's army survive to escape Russia. He only had 8,000 troops and 12 cannons remaining, but he continually cajoled and joked with his troops to keep their spirits high. In November 1812, Ney and his troops were cut off from the main part of the army during the Battle of Krasny. Facing three lines of 12,000 Russian troops, Ney turned down an offer to surrender and launched his outnumbered men against the enemy. They broke through the first two lines, but at the third line, British General Wilson was observing and stated, quote, 40 pieces of cannon loaded with grape simultaneously on the instant vomited their flames and poured their deadly shower on the French assailants. The Russians advanced, shouting their hurrah, sprang forward with fixed bayonets and without firing a musket. A bloody but short struggle ensued. The enemy could not maintain their footing and were driven headlong down the ravine. The sides of the hill were covered with the French dead and dying. End quote. The French retreated, and again the Russian commander sent an emissary to offer an honorable surrender to Ney. As the Russian emissary was offering their terms of surrender, an errant cannon shot from the Russians flew overhead. Ney was disgusted that the Russians would fire at that moment and immediately arrested the Russian, telling him, quote, a marshal of France never surrenders. One does not parley under the fire of the enemy, End quote. As soon as darkness fell, Ney ordered his men to light campfires and despite having no maps or guides, he led his men across the country, all the while eluding the Russians. After they spotted a frozen stream, Ney and his troops carefully crossed the Dnieper River in single file. By this time, the Cossacks, lack of food, and below freezing temperatures had whittled Ney's force down to 2,000 men. For the next few days, Ney's small party bravely stood off Cossack attacks as it marched in search of Napoleon's main army. Meanwhile, the morale of Napoleon and his men sunk lower, fearing they would never see Ney or his soldiers ever again. But the unshakable Ney refused to submit, and with a small band moved through the forests while dodging the pursuing Russian army. Finally, Ney and Napoleon were reunited near Orsha, an event which the French troops regarded as a miracle. When Napoleon heard the news that Ney was still alive and commanding his troops, he stated, quote, At last, I have saved my eagles. I have 300 million francs at the Tuileries. I'd give up the whole lot to save Ney, 
What a soldier! The army of France is full of brave men, but Michel Ney is truly the bravest of the brave. End quote. Napoleon dubbed him Prince of the Moskva. Ney continued his stubborn rearguard right up to the Polish border, and he was reputedly the last French soldier to leave Russian soil. When he finally reached safety, his formal marshal's uniform was in tatters. He was filthy and had grown a thick beard. His appearance was so haggard that when he reached the safe camp of French General Dumas, the general inquired, quote, Who are you? End quote. Ney responded, quote, Don't you recognize me? I am Marshal Ney, the rear guard of the Grand Armée. I have fired the last shot on the bridge at Kovno. I have made my way here across a hundred fields of snow. Have you any soup? I'm damn hungry. End quote. After a few months of rest and recuperation, along with a handsome endowment of 800,000 francs from Napoleon, Ney was back at the front in Germany. At the first battle against the Allied onslaught at Lutzen in May 1813, Ney was wounded and his chief of staff was killed during the fighting. Although Napoleon won the battle, he didn't have the cavalry to follow up for a more crushing victory. The next battle was Bautzen, which was another French victory against the Allies, but Ney made an error in judgment that allowed the Allies to escape. He was supposed to take his corps to cut across the Allies' line of retreat. On his way to his intended position, he became embroiled in capturing the town of Preitz, which had many Allied soldiers defending it. What the marshal should have done was put a holding force in place to keep the enemy pinned in the town, while bypassing it with his main force to get to the emperor's ordered position. But the marshal's blood was up and couldn't see the forest through the trees. As a result, the defeated Russians and Prussians were able to escape the trap. Afterward, Ney's main advisor, Jomini, was recommended for promotion to general of division. But the petty and jealous chief of staff, Marshal Berthier, instead had Jomini arrested for not sending his status reports in a timely fashion. Berthier had long been jealous of Jomini's strategic gifts and the special attention Napoleon gave him. As a result of this arrest and insult, Jomini defected to the Russian army and Ney lost his right-hand man. The marshal fought again at the 1813 Battle of Denowitz, which was an effort to recapture the Prussian capital of Berlin. Ney was defeated by the Prussians and Swedes under the command of his former brother marshal, Bernadotte. When Napoleon received news of the Denowitz disaster, Marshal saint remarked that Napoleon discussed it, quote, with all the coolness he could have brought to a discussion of events in China, end quote. After the October 1813 disaster at the Battle of Leipzig, Napoleon, Ney, and the French army were pushed back into France. In the 1814 campaign to defend French territory from the invading allies, Ney was fighting tooth and nail alongside the emperor, but the writing was on the wall for all to see, except for Napoleon. After the allies had taken Paris, Ney and his brother marshals had seen enough. They didn't want to be part of a civil war, nor did they want to see Paris destroyed in an attempt to evict the allied army. Ney led the Marshal's Revolt in early April 1814, demanding Napoleon's abdication. Ney told Napoleon that the army would not march on Paris. Napoleon responded, quote, The army will obey me, end quote. To which Ney answered, quote, The army will obey its chiefs, end quote. After some negotiations, Napoleon abdicated and was exiled to the island of Elba off the coast of Italy. Marshal Ney was received well by the returning King Louis XVIII and was made a peer of France. But the royal court routinely mocked his commoner birth 
and insulted the marshal's wife on several occasions, which sent Ney into fits of rage. One day, he returned home to find his wife in tears over the abuse she received from one of the royal duchesses. An irate Ney burst into the king's palace and verbally berated the duchess, screaming, quote, I and others were fighting for France while you were sipping tea in English gardens, end quote. Ney was also disgusted by the corruptness of the returning bourbons and by the poor treatment of the army. When Napoleon escaped Elba, Ney steadfastly stood by his king, at least initially. When Napoleon began his long march to Paris, Ney promised to bring back Napoleon in an iron cage. But as Napoleon's march went on, more and more of the army sided with its former emperor. In addition, the French populace greeted Napoleon with enthusiasm. When Ney marched with his troops to stop his former master, Napoleon sent him a letter which said in part, quote, I shall receive you as I did after the Battle of the Moskova, end quote. Despite Ney's promise to the king, he joined Napoleon in March 1815. This act hurt Ney's reputation as a man of honor and probably sealed his fate after the disaster at Waterloo. Oddly enough, Napoleon did not immediately employ Ney to any position during the Hundred Days. But as the Waterloo campaign was beginning against the Prussians and British, he was made commander of the left wing of Napoleon's army in June 1815. The French troops were happy to see Ney back at the front, commenting, quote, there goes Le Rougeau. Things are hopping up now, end quote. Le Rougeau was the common soldier's nickname for Ney, meaning the ruddy or red-faced. Ney's first mission was to seize the critical crossroads at Quatre Bras. It should have been a walkover for Ney with his 20,000 troops, as it was lightly defended by 8,000 British and Dutch troops. But Ney hesitated, perhaps remembering his experiences in Spain, fighting against the Duke of Wellington, who was proficient in hiding his numbers, and Ney was wary of a trap. By the time Ney's attack began in earnest, the crossroads were reinforced by Wellington, and it devolved into a slugging match, with each side suffering 4,000 casualties. At the end of the fight, the British still had the crossroads, but at least Ney prevented them from supporting the Prussians, who were defeated that same day by Napoleon at the Battle of Ligny. From there, Ney and Napoleon pursued the retreating British to the fields of Waterloo. The battle was delayed as a late night thunderstorm had made the fields into a soggy mess. It was thought that waiting for the ground to dry would permit easier movement for the French artillery. Napoleon devised a simple frontal assault on the British defensive positions. After his orders were given, he left the handling of the battle to Ney and his subordinates. Meanwhile, Marshal Grouchy was dispatched to keep the Prussians pinned far away from Waterloo so they could not assist the British. Ney has received much criticism for his handling of the battle, but he probably did the best he could. In the afternoon, Napoleon and the French were attacked in the flank by the Prussians, so Napoleon had to divert troops to stem their advance. With a reduced amount of infantry available, Ney sent repeated cavalry charges to keep the pressure on the British. After the stout British infantry squares repulsed wave after wave of cavalry charges, an exasperated Ney requested more infantry from Napoleon. The indignant emperor replied to the request from Ney, quote, Troops, where do you wish me to take them from? Do you want me to make them? End quote. Finally, Ney and his troops captured the critical position of La Haye Saint and moved up horse artillery to pour fire onto the British positions. The time had come for Napoleon to play his last card, which was the advance of the Imperial Guard his immortals. 
Unfortunately, the guard was thrown back and the rest is history. The French army fled in disorder after seeing the vaunted guard recoil under the heavy fire of the British army. Ney was last seen with a broken sword in his hand, slamming it against a British cannon. After trying to rally the fleeing French troops, Ney finally accepted the inevitable and fled on a horse. A few weeks later, the marshal was arrested by the returning royals and put on trial for high treason. After being denied a trial by a military tribunal made up of his brother marshals, he was put on a trial before a chamber of, quote, peers, end quote. Despite the best efforts of Ney's defense team, the issue was never in doubt. Ney was found guilty, but the sentencing allowed for each member to recommend death or exile. Under pressure from the king and the returning royals, 137 cowards voted for death, including several generals and marshals Kellerman, Marmont, Victor, Serrurier, and Perillon. The marshals were only thinking of themselves and their precious estates. 17 others voted for exile, five abstained, and one brave soul voted for acquittal, the Duke de Broly. Despite pleas for clemency by Ney's wife and others, the king and his royal entourage were embarrassed by their flight during Napoleon's return. An example had to be made of Napoleon's top lieutenant. On December 7, 1815, Ney was lined up before a firing squad in Paris. Going out like the brave soldier he was, he refused a blindfold and was allowed to give the order, quote, Soldiers, when I give the command to fire, fire straight at my heart. Wait for the order. It will be my last to you. I protest against my condemnation. I have fought a hundred battles for France and not one against her. Soldiers, fire, end quote. Ney's battle record was impressive with 13 wins against only seven losses. Many of his victories were due to his unbreakable will to win and his inspiring effect on soldiers of any nation. He possessed some tactical ability despite what many historians have written. Ney has received an unfair share of criticism for the loss at Waterloo, as have Marshals Grouchy and Soult. This would be akin to watching the Super Bowl or World Cup and blaming the loss of your favorite team on the assistant coaches instead of the head coach who employed them. Napoleon did not bring his A game to Waterloo, for whatever reason, and the end result was permanent exile for the emperor and a firing squad for Marshal Ney. And thus ends the story of the bravest of the brave. Or does it? The year after Ney's execution, a tall, red-headed man arrived in America, seemingly from nowhere. He didn't talk much about his past, but was able to secure a teaching position in North Carolina. Records show he was paid $200 for teaching a full school year, and he was known to pay tuition for those who couldn't afford it. This mystery man had an unorthodox curriculum, introducing his rural students to subjects such as French poetry, French language lessons, painting, and fencing. The teacher's favorite subject was military tactics, along with the stories of Napoleon's conquests. Geography lessons were so detailed that it seemed the instructor had personally been to every country in Europe. The mystery man's name was Peter Stuart Ney. He had many scars on his body and insisted on starting his classes with his students lined up for inspection as if it were a military review. One day, a traveling fencing master stopped by the school to offer lessons. Instructor Ney challenged him to a duel to test his skills. Ney defeated his opponent so quickly 
that the fencing master announced there was no need for his services since the school already had a fencing master. Ney's teaching reputation grew to the point where Davidson College asked him to design their school seal. The seal, which is still used to this day, includes a distinctive sword that resembles one that Napoleon once awarded to Marshal Ney. In 1821, when Peter Stewart read of Napoleon's death in exile on St. Helena, he dropped to his knees and attempted to commit suicide by slashing his neck with a knife. He was unsuccessful. He continued teaching in North Carolina, and many veterans of the Napoleonic Wars who emigrated to America agreed that he bore an uncanny resemblance to the famous marshal. In 1832, when Napoleon's son, the King of Rome, died, Ney again became severely depressed and drank heavily. Apparently, he let it slip that he was indeed the famous Marshal Ney. So was Peter Ney just an imposter, or was he truly Marshal Ney in hiding after supposedly being executed? Did he create a new version of his name since Michel Ney was already a legend? His new name held clues since Peter was the English version of Ney's father, Pierre, and his mother's maiden name was Stuart. As a final act to this legend, Peter Stuart Ney, who died in 1846, was asked on his deathbed if he was indeed the famous Marshal Ney. Supposedly, Peter replied, quote, I will not die with a lie on my lips. I am Marshal Ney of France. End quote. Is it possible that Ney's firing squad death was faked? There is some evidence supporting this theory. Ney was a Freemason, as was the Duke of Wellington and several other marshals and generals in the respective armies. Perhaps they hatched a plan to fake Ney's death and spirit him away to America. Allegedly, in the moments before his death, when Ney walked by his firing squad, he told the soldiers to aim high. This is counter to what Ney always told his troops, which was to aim low. The logic being, even if you miss someone's torso, if you aim low, you will stop a man in his tracks. There is also some evidence in the famous portrait of Ney's death by Jean-Léon Jérôme. In the painting, Marshal Ney is shown to be laying face down. Usually, when a wall of musket fire hits someone in the chest, they are thrown backwards and come to rest on their back. Marshal Ney's corpse is shown laying on its front. In addition, there was no coup de grace shot given to the marshal's head to ensure death. Could it be that all of the musket fire missed on purpose and the marshal had a secret packet of goat's blood hidden in his coat to give the impression he had been killed? On the contrary, it should be noted at this time in America that there was widespread fascination with Napoleon's fallen court and its army. Impersonating exiled French aristocracy and officers was a career choice for some swindlers. Many con men with enough French could pass themselves off as members of Napoleon's inner circle and it is highly unlikely that the Duke of Wellington would help his old nemesis, Marshal Ney. I personally visited Ney's grave in Cleveland, North Carolina, a few years ago. It's a modest grave in the middle of nowhere, and it has a pleasant, serene feel to it. There is a plaque that reads, quote, In memory of Peter Stuart Ney, a native of France and soldier of the French Revolution under Napoleon Bonaparte who departed this life November 15th, 1846, aged 77 years, end quote. Regardless of whose remains they are, it is a simple, non-ostentatious marker that is indicative of Marshal Ney's take on life. Despite the many titles and vast wealth he obtained, he was a warrior, nothing more, nothing less. So great was the British respect for Ney 
that they named a warship after him during World War I. He was a man respected by all who encountered him. I believe we will finish up on this point. Join us again next time, where we wrap up Napoleon's Marshals with a special guest for a Q&A session. Thanks for listening.